Hello, this is Dr. Michael Greger coming to you live from my treadmill to give you live Q and A's every month. And this month it is right now. Um, uh, I just finished a uh, Facebook uh, live at noon, and now I'm here to finish up all, any other questions you may have. Um, uh, and so every month I do this, uh, and so we'll be uh, answering questions for the next half an hour. For those of you unfamiliar with my work. Uh, every year, I read through every issue of every English Nature Nutrition Journal in the world. So busy folks like you don't have to. Then I compile all the most interesting, most groundbreaking, most practical findings, new videos, and articles I upload every day to my nonprofit site, nutritionfacts.org. Everything on the website is free. There are no ads, no commercial sponsorships, strictly no corporate sponsorships, strictly non-commercial. Um, uh, uh, not selling anything, just putting up as a public service as a labor of love as a tribute to my grandmother, which is the reason I do all the work that I do. It's the reason I became a doctor in the first place. All right, let's get to your questions here. I see they are pouring in. Should I start? Why don't I start at the top? Because then that's only fair to the people who came here first and posted. Um, right? Oh, do they go up or down? Okay, hold on. Um, it doesn't look like I can go all the way to the top. That's crazy. Okay, as far as I can go is, um, oh man, they're moving quick. Okay, Richard asks, is there any research? Damn. Okay, my <laughs> Joey asks, what are your thoughts on a potato only diet? I think a potato only diet could lead to vitamin A deficiency, and your eyes could melt out of your eye sockets. Don't do it. Now, of course. If you eat sweet potatoes, then that wouldn't be a problem. But uh, I wouldn't recommend eating only one food of any kind. Um, we should eat a, a diversity of food. Um, and so sweet potatoes are fantastic. Um, I would just eat other wonderful foods too. All right. Eliza asks, is there any evidence backing up the health claims around pink Himalayan sea salt over sea salt? Um, pink Himalayan salt is a uh, marketing ploy to, um, uh, to, 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 to rip off gullible folks. Um, Himalayan sea salt is as bad or worse, if there's any toxic uh, metals, um, than regular salt. And regular salt is bad. The number one um, risk factor for death in the world is high blood pressure. So we want to cut down to sodium intake. I recommend getting down to the American Heart Association recommendation of 1,500 milligrams a day. And to do that, you have to pretty much eliminate uh, processed foods and added salt. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's Himalayan or not, if it's pink or not. Sydney asks, is coffee a few times a week okay? I talk about coffee. Um, in uh, the, my chapters in How Not to Die on my liver chapter, um, uh, the uh, Alzheimer's chapter, Parkinson's chapter. Um, and so uh, coffee may actually be beneficial for the mind, lung, excuse me, mind, brain, and liver. Um, uh, decreasing risk of fatty liver disease. Um, coffee drinkers do tend to live a little longer than non-coffee drinkers. Um, but uh, coffee can also, it's not for everybody, coffee can increase GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Um, so if you have acid reflux, um, it can lead, it can contribute to bone loss because um, it can uh, worsen uh, um, uh, glaucoma. Um, what else? Um, oh, uh, urinary incontinence. Um, uh, so I mean, there are some uh, conditions for which you shouldn't be drinking coffee. But bottom line is, I don't recommend coffee. Why? Because every cup of coffee is a lost opportunity to drink something even healthier, which is a cup of green tea. So I recommend the healthiest, three healthiest beverages are number one, water, um, uh, number two, uh, green tea um, or white tea, even better, and then hibiscus tea, which is an herbal tea, um, which can actually decrease. We were just talking about high blood pressure, actually decrease blood pressure on the order of uh, what uh, many kind of first line diuretic drugs can do, but without the side effects. In fact, only good side effects. If it seems like I'm skipping around with the questions, it's not because I'm picking them out. I start reading them before I even see what the question is. It's just that the question scroll is moving so quick, I just have to jump right in because otherwise I lose the question and I can't finish it. Okay, 
So, um, uh, Houston Marsh asked, do the probiotics and pickles outweigh the problems called, caused by salt? Um, there, there shouldn't, well, I mean, commercial pickles don't have probiotics um, because they're anything in a jar is pasteurized. Is I mean, they have to expose it to boiling temperatures to kind of seal it off. You know, that pop one you get from the jar, that's because they, you know, anyway. But if you can actually get um, in like a refrigerated section of a health food store, you can actually get real fermented foods. That, that's, they have to be refrigerated because otherwise they'll go bad, unlike pickles in the jar. Um, and they do have uh, probiotics. Unfortunately, they also have lots of salt, which we just talked about. Um, why? Because the salt actually keeps the bad bugs from growing and uh, facilitates the growth of the good bacteria that can survive the high salt environment like lactobacillus. Um, but where did that lactobacillus come from in the first place? Where did, you know, uh, you know, when people think uh, you make sauerkraut, you're like, okay, you take some cabbage and then you add some kind of starter or something. No, the lactobacillus bacteria are present on the cabbage leaves in the field when you pick it. And all you do when you dunk it in salt water is that you prevent the growth of some of the rotting bacteria and the lactobacillus grow, but it's right there. So by eating raw fruits and vegetables, we can get the best of both worlds, probiotics, the good bacteria that are sitting on the, on the veggies, and the prebiotics, the fiber resistant starch that our good bacteria eat. Um, otherwise, we are starving our microbial self, which is not a good thing. Um, and so, but I would stay away um, from uh, these kind of fermented foods because the salt intake, there's a reason that um, uh, Korea has the highest stomach cancer rates in the world. Um, it's because kimchi is kind of the national food. And the second highest stomach cancer rates in the world is Japan. Um, they also eat a lot of uh, dried salted fish and uh, preserved vegetables. And in fact, uh, the Japan refused to publish How Not to Die unless I added an extra chapter. You know, in the uh, most versions, I have the top 15 killers, uh, chapters on each of the top 15 killers. Well, one of the top killers in Japan is stomach cancer. Um, and so they wanted a chapter on stomach cancer. So I had to do a special chapter just the for the Japanese version and basically told everyone to cut down on salt. Um, so it's not just high blood pressure, but also the gastric irritation, the stomach lining irritation can increase one's risk of stomach cancer. And you can do interventional studies where you show someone eats something like a fermented vegetable. And you can see, you can do stomach biopsies, serial stomach biopsies day after day, and you see the damage that's being done, the inflammation that could eventually lead to cancer. All right, Olaf asks, as electric pressure cookers recently became popular, I was wondering if I consider pressure cooking as a good cooking method. I have one of those electric pressure cookers. It's because I stayed at the house of somebody who had one and was so impressed that I got one. What do I do with it? I cook beans. So I think in the book, I talk about how I eat canned beans because they're so convenient and that's awesome. And so you stay away from BPA lined uh, canned beans, you stay away from salt added canned beans. But, and saying, you know, yeah, cooking beans from scratch is cheaper, a few cents as opposed to a few dozens of cents per serving. Um, but it turns out that uh, it's super easy with a electronic electric pressure cooker, put beans in and you press a button and you walk away and the house doesn't burn down and you can get videos done and everything cooks and how cool is that? Um, so, I mean, you can make like, you know, steel cut oatmeal in just a few minutes. In fact, even better than steel cut oatmeal, actually whole oat groats themselves, which are what is, you know, either sliced in half to make uh, steel cut or rolled to make rolled oats. You actually get the groats themselves, super easy to cook in an uh, electric pressure cooker. I have become a big fan. In fact, the only thing I am sad about is that I bought like the smaller one. And in thinking back, I was like, oh, I should have got the big one because I like making big batches of food. All right. Daniel asks, can a change in diet reverse atrial fibrillation? And do people who, and do I know people who successfully did it? Um, uh, so there are dietary approaches to preventing atrial fibrillation. So for example, things you can do after, oh, uh, you know, bypass surgery to decrease your risk of atrial fibrillation, including dietary approaches. But in terms of once you already have it, getting rid of it, I don't think there's any interventional trials that I know about. Um, but I will look into it. If I find anything, I will do a video about it. Thank you for that question. All right. 
Um, Samuel asks, what is the best supplement for Hashimoto's uh, thyroiditis? Um, and uh, I don't know of a particular supplement that would help um, with any autoimmune disease. Um, well, uh, turmeric, I guess, um, for some, but it hasn't been tested for Hashimoto. So I don't think there is a, uh, a magic bullet supplement for Hashimoto's. In fact, there's few magic bullet supplements for anything, though vitamin D can uh, certainly have some effects. Um, have we seen in randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials, and I have a bunch of videos on what vitamin D can do, one of the few supplements actually shown to extend lifespan, not just associated with greater lifespan, but you actually randomize people to vitamin D or placebo. Those taking vitamin D pills live longer and have lower uh, of a variety of disease rates. Check out the videos. But that's very rare. It's very unusual that a pill can actually have those kind of effects in uh, in terms of a supplement. All right, is there any specific diet, asked Jennifer Stone, um, to prevent, treat, or heal ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease? Absolutely, obviously haven't typed in ulcerative colitis or Crohn's into nutritionfacts.org. And I've got uh, a bunch of videos on both prevention and treatment. In fact, it's not just uh, plant-based diets can't be used, used as a treatment, but actually the most effective treatment um, so I believe there's 90% remission rates two years out. That's really extraordinary uh, by a team of Japanese researchers. Uh, check it out. Just type in Crohn's into nutritionfacts.org. All right. Vegan Renegade asks probiotics with antibiotics. Actually, it wasn't a question, just those three words. Um, uh, presuming the question is, should one take probiotics with antibiotics? Ideally, not take antibiotics in the first place, unless you really need it, um, but you want to make sure that's the case for many common uses of antibiotics, such as childhood ear, most childhood ear infections and uh, bronchitis and stuff. Actually, you don't need antibiotics and actually do more harm than good. But if you do have to take antibiotics, there are certain circumstances where probiotics would help. Um, uh, but um, um, so, for example, antibiotic induced on um, diarrhea, probiotics can indeed be effective in treating. Travis asks, uh, says that his bowel movements are so big, not to brag, but Trevor, Travis, excuse me, Travis, bowel movements so big from all the fiber, it's stretching and cracking, bleeding. Okay. Um, okay. Um, the size of the bowel movements is is, I mean, what we're looking for is consistency. I mean, eating lots of fiber rich foods and enough water, you should have large bowel movements, but they shouldn't be large in diameter. They should be large in volume. They should be soft and squishy. They should not be hard enough to stretch and crack and bleed. And if you are, um, then it does not sound like you're eating enough um, uh, uh, you know, fiber rich foods and particularly fiber found, the inside of the fiber found in whole grains, for example. So if you're eating those wheat groats, for example, uh, not wheat groats, oatmeal, oat groats, well, I guess wheat berries too, um, uh, then that would be a good source. Um, you know, people have this sense, oh, I eat, I eat tons of fiber, I eat lots of fruits and vegetables, but actually, you know what fruits and vegetables are? Water, but 90% water. Um, and so, yes, there's fiber, but, and, you know, but there's just a, you know, few grams here or there. If you want fiber, fiber, then it's legumes and whole grains. Um, beans, split peas, chickpeas, lentils, whole grains. That's where you get lots of fiber. Um, and that should soften uh, large, soft bowel movements. That's the, that's what we're looking for. Ashley um, asks, arsenic and rice, question mark, question mark, question mark. Um, Indeed. So uh, just uh, recently on social media, I made this recommendation for people to cut down the rice, rice consumption. And if you go back, um, I've got really ancient videos like a decade ago, 2008, I think it's the last videos I did in our second rice. I'm in this. Um, uh, but there's just been a tremendous amount of uh, research done since then. Um, uh, about uh, 200 papers published. Um, and so it was definitely time to go back. And so I just scripted 13 new videos on arsenic and rice. And there, you're gonna, it's gonna be so much arsenic and rice videos, you're gonna get sick of it. But there's just that much really good information in terms of 
which rice has the lowest arsenic? Is it short grain, medium grain, whole grain, brown versus white, conventional, organic? You, uh, you know, South Central U.S. rice, Arkansas, Texas rice versus California rice versus India, Pakistan, Chinese rice, uh, red rice, black rice, um, uh, you know, infant rice, cereal rice, pasta. There's all sorts of um, really um, uh, good data out there. And so, but basically, I didn't want to wait until uh, the videos came out because I thought it was a kind of a, it was critical information. So that's what I use um, social media for. So I encourage people to, you know, follow me on Facebook or Twitter, et cetera. And then something comes out like, oh, wow, people with Crohn's disease shouldn't be eating nutritional yeast. Wow, okay, here's the video, but the video still has to be, you know, recorded and, and it won't be on the, on the website for weeks, but people should know right now um, and so anything like that where something changes um, that could change your day dating habits, I make sure to get it out of social media. And then, of course, don't believe me just because I say it. Um, I'm just saying, look, the video is coming where I'll actually show you the science. You can make up your own mind. So the same thing happened with arsenic and rice. Um, see, traditionally, uh, the, uh, the, the recommendations as to how much rice is too much given the arsenic content, particularly of South Central rice, Arkansas, Texas rice. Why? Because of decades of arsenic containing pesticides using the cotton fields to kill off the boll weevil. And so we soaked Arkansas with these arsenic containing pesticides. And then King Cotton is no more. So what do we do? We grow rice patties in that same area and sucks up the arsenic. And so that's why it has about twice as much arsenic as California rice. Um, and not, not to mention the arsenic containing drugs given to chickens by literally the hundreds of thousands of pounds. Um, and then that arsenic, um, and then the chicken manure is used in the, in the rice patty. And then the, uh, there's all sorts of reasons. Okay, but the bottom line is given the amount of arsenic rice, what can we do to decrease our risk? There's a number of things we can do. Um, well, so, um, so for example, consumer reports. I uh, came out with a number of exposés and said you shouldn't eat more than two servings of rice a week. Um, and, you know, kids shouldn't be drinking rice milk. Um, adults, half a cup of rice milk um, a day at most. A day at most, maybe a week at most. I have to look at it again. But I remember the rice, two servings of rice max. Now, and so I was like, okay, but then, but that was based on the water standards. Um, so the EPA set uh, standards for 10 parts per billion of arsenic. And assuming that you drink like a liter a day, like four cups of water a day. And so 10 is kind of the, the max. And so then you can find out how much arsenic is rice. And then you can say, oh, okay, two servings. And then you're like, well, hey, if you boil rice like pasta and then drain off the excess water, I mean, instead of cut it, you know, cooking it until dry in a rice cooker or something, you actually can get rid of up to 60%. You can get rid of 40% cooking in a six to one water to rice ratio. You can get rid of 60% cooking in a 10 to one water ratio. Um, so that cuts it down. So wait a second, if you just cut it in half, then instead of Consumer Reports 2, can't we get four? And then if we get like, you know, California rice, um, uh, can't we, uh, th that has half the arsenic, can we get it even lower? Um, so can't you have like eight servings a week? Um, and so look, then that's a serving a day. What's the big deal? The problem is the water standards. The water standards are not based on uh, the, it's basically on economics and technical uh, technological feasibility, not based on safety. So um, carcinogens, typically the way um, the acceptable cancer risk is one in a million. One in a million excess uh, cancer cases in terms of uh, lifetime cancer risk. So some company wants to put out a new chemical. Basically, the regulatory agency says, okay, well, you show me that it doesn't cause more than one million extra cancer cases. Now, you say, wait a second. There's 300 million people in this country. <laughs> you know, uh, what about the 300, what about the hundreds of people that are going to get cancer because of your new chemical? You say, well, look, you got to make a cutoff somewhere. And uh, the kind of commonly accepted, acceptable, tolerable uh, level of cancer risk is one in a million. Okay, excess cases. All right. Um, and so I just assume, well, that's what the water standard was for arsenic, but no. That's because it's actually impossible to get um, arsenic and water that low. You can really only get it down to like um, uh, three parts per billion is kind of technological feasibility. So wait a second, why is it up at 10? Actually, if you wanted to get it down to one in a million, you'd have to be at 0 0.02 parts per billion. So basically, um, the, the 
standard for arsenic and water is hundreds of times greater than we'd accept cancer risk, anything else. So it's like one in 10,000 risks is 100 times more, even 300 times more risk than we'd accept from any other carcinogen. And the reason is, is because it's just really hard to get arsenic out of water. And the reason it's not down at least to five, which is the New Jersey standard, the most strictest standard in the world, I'm excited to say, go New Jersey. Um, but it's just, it costs money. Um, and uh, so there's kind of an economic burden, so it's cost benefit now. So, of course, they don't tell anybody this. Um, but so, but sticking, so, but that, that rice, uh, water aside, the rice, you don't use the water stand because the water stand is 300 times too lax. Um, and so you say, well, wait a second. Um, then, uh, then um, basically, the bottom line is I think all processed rice products like rice milk, white rice, um, rice, uh, uh, you know, uh, these uh, junk food like, that has organic brown rice syrup, like granola bars and stuff, and these like energy blocks that athletes eat, um, instead of being yellow light foods, because they're processed plant foods, should be red light foods. So instead of telling people to moderate their, to minimize their consumption, I encourage people to avoid those foods. And there's rooms of brown rice, um, which would normally be a green light food, because it's a whole plant food, meaning maximize consumption. Uh, the question is, does one move it to yellow light, minimize, or to red light, avoid? And that, um, as far as I'm concerned, is based on how much you like rice. If you really like rice, um, then there's things you can do to decrease your consumption. Choose the low rice arsenic. You can cook it in a certain way. You can minimize your intake um, to a serving to a week, like the like the like the Consumer Report says. But um, that would still expose you to 100 times. Uh, you know, more arsenic than you may want to be putting in your diet based on typical acceptable uh, cancer risk standards. And there's all sorts of non-cancer risks associated with arsenic, which I get into. I mean, there's actually people like with celiac disease with lots of rice because I cut out wheat, barley, rye. They actually get arsenic poisoning. They actually, not just like theoretical long-term cancer risk, but actually get sick right now because they're getting too much arsenic because they're eating too much rice. So particularly for people who eat macrobiotic diets or eat a lot of, a lot of rice, this is really important. Cut down your consumption. And for people that don't care either way what kind of whole intact grain they're getting, they don't care if it's, they're eating quinoa or rice, it doesn't matter to them, then eat the quinoa because other grains have 10 times less arsenic. Um, and so encourage people to switch um, if it doesn't make much difference. So that would effectively moving it into the red light region. Boy, that was a lot. Sorry about taking all that time, but it's important. And there will be 13 videos. Oh, and it's so hilarious with the rice industry responses. You won't believe it. Or actually, you will believe it if you've followed any corporate hijinks on nutritionfacts.org. Woo! Okay, Alex asks, does living on a plant-based diet decrease the risk of DVT? Oh, um, deep vein thrombosis. Um, uh, uh, that's a good question. Um, I do have a bunch of videos topic talking about, uh, um, uh, talking about, um, uh, homo hemorrheology. Basically, that's the study of the flowability of blood and the fact that um, eating different foods can have on it, um, which can increase risk for a bunch of kind of thrombotic events, whether it's a heart attack, most types of stroke, or something like DVT. Um, so I'm going to have a bunch of videos about that. I'm trying to remember, bottom line, it's been tested in an interventional study. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, let me look. But, but um, Definitely uh, know that I've got a bunch of uh, videos coming up on DVT, but it's going to be a while because that's a huge folder. My heart disease folder just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Sergio asks, has the USDA changed your mind about eggs being advertised as healthy, nutritious, or safe, and why? And no. So um, I have this hilarious video, one of my favorite videos. I did this Freedom of Information Act um, uh, request. Um, of, about uh, the hijinks from the egg industry um, and, uh, and got all this internal communications uh, from the, you know, the, the poultry people of the USDA telling the egg industry, no, oh, you can't say eggs are healthy. You can't say they're nutritious. Oh, my God. can't even say they're safe because of salmonella poisoning, because of the amount of cholesterol they have, not to mention saturated fat. You can't get meat. You can't call it safe. You can't legally call it safe using American egg board money. Why? Because that's 
um, that's uh, overseen by the federal government. So if you're doing something with the tens of millions of dollars set aside uh, to promote eggs in this country, then under the auspices of the federal government, you cannot do things illegally. I mean, you can't say things that aren't true. Now, if you want to run an ad with your own money, not American Egg Board money, but just some company, then you can say anything you want. You can say whatever you want. Cigarettes are good for you. Eggs are good for you. Um, but if you actually want to use American Egg Board money, you still cannot say they are healthy, nutritious, nor safe. Um, because there's, uh, you know, uh, the FTC, there's, there's, you know, otherwise false and misleading. Okay, Jordan asks, will juicing our greens help us to meet the minimum servings of vegetables a day? Um, or will the reduction in fiber lower the serving count? So, yeah, I probably wouldn't consume. Um, yeah, so when I recommend that you should eat, I think my uh, recommendation is three servings a day of dark green leafy vegetables, one of which should be cruciferous. If I remember my own daily dozen recommendations, um, I'm assuming you're eating the whole vegetables, not throwing away the fiber. Um, and so. Um, so what I'd recommend, blending your vegetables. You say, well, wait a second, how do you do that? So, um, oh, I wish I, in fact, I, I, think I have the jar back over there. Can you see it? Um, anyway, shouldn't show you my dirty dishes. But um, is uh, what I, uh, my latest favorite drink is this V12 smoothie, uh, which is um, um, basically it's like V8 juice, but instead of like carrot juice and parsley juice, I just put in a whole carrot, whole Thing of parsley, you know, whole celery, uh, turmeric root, um, bell pepper, you know, all this stuff. Um, and you put it in with some ice and you blend it up and it's bright green, of course, but then you get all these amazing vegetables and you didn't lose anything. So that's it. So it's better to blend than juice. Um, same thing with fruit, but uh, I didn't think you could do it with vegetables too, but you totally can. Um, and it's delicious. So it's kind of a savory green smoothie as opposed to a sweet green smoothie. All right, Libertarian Liz asks, I just cut some spinach and broccoli. How long should they sit before you put them to cook? 45 minutes um, or um, cook them right now and then add to the cooked um, spinach broccoli um, some raw cruciferous. So add some uh, raw add a little arugula or some raw broccoli or something, or add mustard powder, which is a raw cruciferous vegetable. And it doesn't matter about the spinach. Spinach is not a cruciferous vegetable, so you can cook, it doesn't matter how you cook it, chop it. Um, uh, you're not gonna get any sulforaphane either way. But for the broccoli, you should uh, use the, uh, the, the weight technique or the second strategy for maximizing broccoli, broccoli um, sulforaphane production. And you say, what am I talking about? Um, just uh, type in second strategy into nutritionfacts.org and my videos will pop up and give you more details. All right. Balin asks, is lean chicken breast really that bad? Um, uh, well, foods are not bad or good. They are better or worse. And so it depends what you'd be eating the chicken breast instead of. And so if you ate the chicken breast instead of eating a hot dog, then that would actually be healthful, a healthful choice. But if you're eating chicken breast compared to, you know, uh, the, you know, uh, the, I don't know, uh, some bean burrito or something, then no, absolutely not. It would have more uh, saturated fat, less fiber, and have all the problems associated with consumption of animal protein and everything um, that I talk about. So, um, uh, I would, uh, so uh, is it really that bad compared to what? Compared to most, compared to most whole plant foods, it really is that bad. Compared to processed meats, no, not bad at all. Those are better choices. Um, all right, Bernard, the disappointed owl, asks, how long does sulforaphane last in the fridge? Um, I, I, I'm sure the sulforaphane will last as long as that vegetable does. I think the vegetable will go down before the sulforaphane, so I wouldn't worry about it. The Dark Emperor of Memes asks, what are the best ways? Oh, I'm out of time. But okay, what are the best ways to prevent infections with diet? The best way to prevent not get infected in the first place. So uh, you wash your fruits and vegetables under running water. 
um, and you stay away from, uh, you know, foods that uh, um, are associated with the most increased risk of the worst uh, foodborne diseases like salmonella, which hospitalizes and kills more than any other uh, foodborne bacteria. And so that's, um, so we're talking about, you know, bugs like Campylobacter salmonella found predominantly in poultry. And you say, who eats undercooked poultry? It's no, it's the cross contamination. It's the fact that um, before that, uh, you know, fresh or frozen chicken makes it into the pond, um, you're exposing common kitchen surfaces to these bugs, which can then transfer to other foods or your hands or utensils or something or dishcloth and then infect other foods and that's why um, there's just millions of, inf of uh, foodborne infections every year caused by bugs that are totally destroyed by cooking but that's because of cross-contamination issues and so I would uh, I would be very careful about uh, you know having someone's raw chicken dripping onto your broccoli one shelf down if your roommate is uh, making less than healthful choices. Thank you so much, everybody. See you next month at my next live Q&As. Uh, subscribe to find out when the times are. Have a wonderful day.